Thank you for tuning into IoT Connect, where we're covering some of the most interesting topics, trends, and news around the Internet of Things. IoT Connect is brought to you by Teal, a wholly owned, patented eSIM platform that connects any IoT device to any network around the world. Now, I'm excited to welcome you all to this episode of IoT Connect. If you're like us and you're passionate about IoT, be sure to click that like button and subscribe so you don't miss a beat. Today, I'm excited to welcome Mark Cranny to our show. From farming in Southern Idaho to hands-on operator at some of the most successful technology companies, Mark has successfully led three high growth companies to unicorn status in his career as an operator. He was the COO at Skydio, an enterprise and consumer drone company where he led all operations and go-to-market strategy for the company. Prior to Skydio, he was the COO at Signal FX, and Mark was the founding operating partner of Anderson Horowitz's market development team. He led worldwide field operations for Opsware, and his company building skills at Opsware are well chronicled in two of Ben Horowitz's books, The Hard Thing About Hard Things, and What You Do Is Who You Are. Mark has seen what it takes to achieve greatness, and it is my immense pleasure to have this go-to-market legend of the sales game on our podcast today. Mark, thank you for being on our show. Thanks for having me. Let's face it, in the in the world of IoT, drones are cool. And to that end, I thought we would kick things off by talking about your role as COO at Skydio. You led the drone revolution and you covered everything from consumer use cases to mission critical defense applications. When it comes to these more serious mission critical use cases, how are drones helping with things like national defense, with first responders, or even with enterprises? Yeah, well, I, I actually got involved with the company very early as on from an investor standpoint. Uh, Andreessen Horowitz did the A round. So I kind of uh, tracked the company and helped them a little bit along the way prior to coming on full time, right after they released their uh, Skydio drone, which for the consumer market, but what it was brought in to do was uh, build out an enterprise and public sector uh, businesses. Um, the high, the two high level use cases for drones in, uh, the public sector, meaning federal type applications and, or first responder applications, uh, as well as enterprise applications. There's really two ways of thinking about it. One, they're typically used as a situational awareness tool for the soldier, for the first responder, uh, even for industrial IoT type use cases, there's a lot of uh, security and surveillance as well as situational awareness uh, uh, applications that, you know, have normally be done, been done on the ground. You know, essentially a drone is a flying camera and today's drones that are, you know, particularly with the differentiation that Skydio has, which being really a you know, very advanced autonomy that's driven by the AI and ML and computer vision they build in there to avoid obstacles. They can create a 3D real-time uh, map of the world to avoid any obstacles as you're uh, making it a lot easier to fly for an operator. Um, so, you know, you can think of all the use cases, you know, of not putting a soldier in harm's way when you can send in a drone first uh, to get eyes on a situation and understand what's going on and then be able to act is, is a use case. Same for, you know, police and fire, customs and border, um, any first responder situation, search and rescue, uh, just being able to get to a situation, assess that in an OTA loop a lot quicker uh, and in a lot more safe environment. The second major use case other than situational awareness is inspection. So in asset inspection and what Scotty have done because of this advanced AI they, and computer vision they build in for the obstacle avoidance, uh, they can also create a, a, a 3D map of the world because of all the, the processing that they're, they've done. You know, a drone or in pretty much any IoT device is essentially now a data center in, in and of itself. And, and they can process all that data, video, pictures and uh, pre-programmed to go inspect an asset without running into it, get all the, 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 the camera video uh, captured 
and then stitch together a 3D representation of that asset uh, or what they would call a digital twin uh, for asset inspection. So that same use case is also done on the defense side. It can be done on the first responder side, probably more prevalent on the enterprise side uh, and where a lot of the traction was done was, you know, that we made, um, you know, think of, you know, bridge inspection, why, you know, risk, uh, you know, human life and time and speed to go inspect a bridge when you can throw up a drone, it can essentially avoid all the obstacles, go take all the pictures, stitch that all together, create a digital twin and an engineer can go, you know, it can, you know, that data can be uh, processed on the drone and then pushed to a centralized cloud where a remote engineer with the skill set can go do the actual breakdown of, you know, where, you know, how good a shape is the bridge in, right? So uh, those are the two kind of use cases, same inspection use cases for the, the soldier or the first responder. Think of a first responder showing up to an accident scene uh, rather than get out there and, you know, stop traffic on the 101 or I-5 and where you're at for hours and piss off the whole entire population, uh, taking a bunch of pictures, you know, uh, uploading that into the cloud, you know, uh, Axon, evidence.com type cloud for later on, you know, to review it or a, a crime scene, same, same type of example. They could throw the drone up, it'll automatically take hundreds, if not thousands of pictures stitch all that together that can be reviewed later in a central cloud. Um, so a lot of very exciting use cases, uh, you know, with flying cameras, flying data centers uh, in the, at least in my time with Skydio. So those same type of use cases though also apply to, you know, a ground robot and or a self-driving car, a boat, you know, logistics type use cases, whether it's situational awareness, inspection, uh, tracking, you know, how the device is working, industrial IoT type applications uh, for machinery. So uh, pretty exciting space. Very exciting stuff. And so when you think about, you know, situational awareness, surveillance, reconnaissance, and, you know, the amount of data, you know, that some of these drones are perhaps <clears throat> consuming, you know, when it comes to live video even, or, or taking hundreds of thousands of pictures, as you mentioned, how, how important is it to ensure that these drones or ground robots that are, are moving around stay reliably connected? Well, that's all, you know, that, that is the big issue, right? It's connectivity and range and, you know, time to, to get it. You know, the latency is, is super important, particularly in a live stream type situation. So, um, you know, you've got a, a lot of, you know, the older technology and even the as is environment today, in a lot of cases, it's more radio type controlled um, with the, you know, the increases in the pipe and bandwidth with, you know, 5G and eventually 6G, um, the connectivity and latency and range, you know, starts to starts to really increase. And rather than being relying on radio, you know, specific radio frequencies that can change by geography, that can, you know, you know, some can be used by commercial for commercial applications. Some can't. Some can be used different frequencies by the military. Uh, super, you know, connectivity is a you know is, is crucial. Uh, you know, the warfighter showing up in a, a new hostile environment and swapping out SIM cards because uh, you know is is a is a problem. Um, and or if they're going from one area to another where you've got a different carrier, you know, that's a big problem as well. Um, and or you've got interference happening on the network. That, that's, a, that's a, you know, these are all real life problems that, you know, the warfighter, uh, an enterprise scenario might run into as well. Think of a, a rel company like a BNSF that mm -hmm. you know, spans the, the United States and you've got different carriers and different, uh, you know, strengths of, of coverage across different geographies. Uh, you know, if you take that to the, you know, worldwide situation that those connectivity problems multiply apply pretty quickly. So. so let's talk about that for just a moment. You know, we talk about these connectivity challenges, you know, moving between and in and out of different geographical regions, different carrier networks. What are some of the uh, 
solutions, connectivity solutions that are in play today that are solving this? And what are some technologies that get you really excited um, as far as keeping things like drones reliably connected around the world? Well, I mean, the first, you know, the, the I mean, traditionally what's happened is people go cut deals with the, the, the mobile operators. But the problem is when you get into multi-geography and or worldwide situations, I mean, you're in a roaming type scenario or you're in a frequency, if you're relying on radio frequencies or private networks, um, you know, the, the big lift and in, in which will help adoption of uh, edge computing devices or IoT devices is, is to be able to seamlessly do that. That's, you know, obviously, I mean, it's, it's a softball question for you, you know the answer. So that's why I got excited when I met the founders of, of Teal uh, and, you know, started digging into this eSIM technology and all the software and security you've layered and functionality you've layered on top of it to be able to seamlessly move across multiple uh, uh, operators in a seamless way, you know, provision over the air, things of that nature. Um, so that that's super exciting, not just for their drones or a robot, but just for any internet connected device, uh, particularly, you know, in the IoT type space. So you gotta be able to connect to start with. And then the processing, the other thing that excites me is just the, the, the chips are getting so, I mean, everything's just getting faster, you know, as we move, um, you know, more uh, compute to the edge, more sensors and devices. If you think about, you know, it, it, it just reminds me of the whole conversion from mainframe to distributed com computing with client server. Then we had the mobile, the web, and you're kind of looking at the TAM, the TAM exploded from, all right, everybody's got a, you know, not everybody, but a lot of people have PCs to now I've got this data center in my hand, you know, your TAM kind of capped out at, you know, six, seven billion people on the planet. But if you think about IoT in general and edge computing and sensors going into things, I mean, the, the TAM becomes, you know, not billions of, of uh, individuals or devices. It, it's, it really if you think about longer term, it, it explodes into the trillions, right? I mean, because you're thinking about the smart home, the smart city, you know, all these robotic type situations, uh, you know, smart health, you know, sensors in your shoes, sensors on your wrist, sensors all over your body. Um, it explodes, but you gotta be able to connect that. And then this, this uh, you know, the more and more compute gets done in these data centers, essentially an IoT device is a data center. Um, it's still got to connect back to the cloud, but a lot of processing gets done in the cloud, the connectivity that you can't break and the latency has got to be fast enough that in the, you know, in the cloud, more of the learning gets done in the cloud and distributed versus, uh, you know, that's what, that's what will hold things back. But as the, as the compute gets better, and the connectivity gets better, the adoption is going to get better from a IoT edge computing use case standpoint. And so, you know, you touched on just how big the world of IoT is becoming. And, you know, on the consumer side, you hear companies like Apple saying, you know, they're they're doing away with the SIM card, right? And they're moving towards eSIM. Now on the M2M side, right, we're seeing the same thing. And I, you know, I got to ask in your, your own personal opinion, are the carriers ready for this massive wave of, of IOT devices that are going to come online? Um, what are your thoughts there? I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it. They all adapt or die though. If you think about, you know, who'd have thought, you know, 20 years ago that, or 30 years ago, digital would disappear. Sun microsystems would disappear. I mean, you know, you either adapt or you're going to die and somebody's going to fill the, fill the gap. So, but I think they're getting ready. I'll, you know, they're at different levels, but I don't know if they're also ready for things to be moving around and all these sensors to be hitting the networks. And, you know, they, they want to keep everything on their network, but that's not always, you know, feasible in right. a lot of these use cases. So, you know, a company like Teal, it's cut deals with, you know, thousands of carriers where you can seamlessly move across uh, is a huge enabler for uh, any IOT 
type device or company, you know, that's developing products and sensors and these data center, you know, small data centers to go connect to the cloud. You got to have that connectivity. You've got to reduce the latency. Otherwise your adoption and use cases and safety is going to be at risk. All right. And you got to be able to do it in a secure way um, that's trusted. Um, otherwise you're going to have, you know, adoption issues that's going to, you know, slow things down as well. If, if you can't do it in a trusted, you know, NDAA type fashion where you mm -hmm. can trust the network, the compute and the latency. So. Well, I thought we would switch gears a little bit. Um, you know, folks that, that, that know you, Mark, know that, you, uh, you know, you come from a, a background of farming as well. Uh, you've got cranny farms and I've got to ask because we've got some customers at Teal uh, that are in the connected agriculture space. And I got to ask, you know, what are some of the um, IoT technologies that you're most excited about when it comes to um, agriculture and farming and, um, you know, helping helping farmers around the United States? Well, I, I left at 18 because it was, you know, it's really hard work, right? I haven't worked since in the traditional sense, but uh, uh, today it's a whole different Ball game, the efficiencies, you know, through the roof. And a lot of that is because of, uh, you know, advancements in technology and the efficiency that that's taking place. You know, it start, probably starts with the, you know, not connected car, but connected uh, machines, you know, like the John Deere's of the world. I mean, self-driving is, you know, probably more adopted now on, on a farm than, than it is in the the general public from a car standpoint, you also don't have a lot of the restrictions, but you know, you don't, uh, you, you don't need to do much on a tractor these days. Uh, you can drive a straight line used to be a skill. Now it's, it's just, a, it's just code, right? Uh, you know, particularly for row crops, which, you know, the family grows a lot of potatoes and, and uh, beets and whatnot. There's a little uh, interesting startup in Idaho that called Soil Tech. They're actually putting a sensor in the ground in the old days when I was there, we just would had implemented all these center pivot systems that you'd have to go in and push the buttons on. All that's you know, you can turn everything on and off remotely from a, a well or a pump standpoint or a sprinkler. You can speed the sprinkler up or slow it down. If you speed it up, it's going to lay less water down. If you slow it down, it's going to lay more. We used to put you know, hand punch in sensors uh, for water as well as. Uh, uh, other conditions to, to, to measure for, you know, things like blight or bugs and things of that nature, but you'd have to go walk the field once or twice a week to, to read the sensors. There's this company called Soil Tech. You just put the sensors in once, five or six per center pivot system that covers 130 acres, and it's all connected via uh, cellular, and, and you're sitting in your office, and you can speed the the sprinkler up or slow it down based on that soil uh, sensor. Um, they don't even dig them up before they harvest. They literally just harvest the sensor up. It goes into the potato cellar and acts as a sensor to make sure the cellar is cool enough and uh, in the right temperature. So you can, you know, uh, uh, ad adapt your, turn your, your, uh, air conditioner up or down in the cellar, depending on what's going on in that sensor. So, and then eventually when they take the potatoes out to be processed or sold as fresh pack, they just pick them off the, off the line and reuse them, dust them off, put a battery in them and throw them back in the next year. So um, maybe I should go back. It's a lot easier farming these days. So. Yeah. It sounds like farming's getting a lot easier than the, than the old days when it was really hard work. Right. Yeah. I don't know what the cousins do these days <laughs> or nephews. So, well, Mark, you've seen thousands, literally thousands of companies. Um, and when it comes to IOT, you know, what are, what are some of the exciting IOT technologies that you think are going to make a dent in the universe in the next you know, three to five years? I, I think it's just, it's literally endless. I think the higher value ones are where you've got the bigger ROI. I mean, if you just take the high level initiatives that go on and say a, a global 2000 company or a fortune 500 company, uh, you know, you drill down into the vertical, say manufacturing, um, you know, in, in manufacturing, they call it IIOT, industrial right. internet of things. 
um, you know, the shop floor, the manufacturing floors, you know, uh, MRO or service and repair type applications. You know, it all starts with getting, you know, the right device, the right level of compute on the device, and then con connectivity is crucial. And being able to do that in a seamless way where you're not have to get caught up with, well, you know, one or two carriers, it's not going to give you the coverage worldwide. I mean, that's a, that's a huge issue. Um, the explosion of, of devices, though, in the edge computing, uh, you know, moving, you know, compute moving out to the edge because the costs keep coming down, the connectivity the, keeps getting better, the latency keeps decreasing, uh, it's really endless. And then there's always still going to be the centralized cloud, but a lot of that's where the, the compute will be used for learning. If you think about the advances in ML and AI, computer vision, NLP, uh, things of that nature, um, you know, they're really endless. So I think the TAM just keeps going through the roof. I think a company like Till is well positioned to be, you know, the big C from a connectivity standpoint in a seamless way. Um, so that's pretty exciting. But if you think if you think about the edge use cases, they're really limitless. So it's pretty exciting. You, you know, taking the chips, taking the software and ML, there's all sorts of new open source software languages I think will be developed over time and are being developed to make everything go quicker. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's all about the sensors and latency and compute and pushing it out to the edge. So just, you know, I wish I was younger. So for those listening in, Mark is a go-to-market legend. I think I mentioned at the beginning of the show, uh, you know, Mark, I, I know you teach seminars on this stuff, but for our listeners today, what's the best go-to-market advice you have for founders? Um, I mean, I've kind of make a, made a, you know, partnered up with a lot of technical product-centric founders in my career. Um, if, if my best advice to uh, product-centric technical founders kind of earn and learn their secret, you know, on the market is to go hire a savant or a series of savants around go to market. I mean, sales, marketing, customer success, operations. And probably the easiest way of thinking about that is to, you know, these have, is the person I'm hiring, have they operated in a playbook or a system that's scaled? And can they go? create that, tweak that, and implement that for your specific uh, value proposition and markets that you want to go serve. Um, you know, sometimes it's hard to figure that out yourself. So pulling somebody in, getting some advice on, all right, what should I be looking for? And what is the criteria uh, from an experience standpoint? Is it an up and comer that maybe hasn't put the whole playbook in before, but they've operated in a great playbook? A lot of that depends on the stage that you're at and what you need done short, medium, and long-term. But, uh, you know, getting some help from the outside to maybe vet who those leaders are is super important. And then, you know, getting involved and learning as much as you can about it. So you kind of know if they're heading down the right track or not. So. Fantastic. Well, there you have it. If you're like us and you're enthusiastic about IOT, be sure to like this video, click that subscribe button. So you don't miss a beat. Be sure to tune into future episodes of IOT connect, and you can learn more at tealcom.io slash IOT connect. Thank you to our listeners for tuning in. And thank you, Mark, for being on our show. Thanks for having me.